trust him with the nuclear codes. He's unqualified to be America's chief executive. He brags that he's a business guy, but we've got a lot of businessmen and women who succeed without stiff and small businesses and workers. Out. Once they've already done work for you and then suddenly you don't pay them, and you basically say, you know what, because I got more lawyers than you, I don't have to pay you? This is the first candidate in decades to hide his tax returns. He hasn't paid his federal income taxes in years. Which means that, which means that he's, not, he's not contributing to our veterans. He's not contributing to our troops. He's not contributing to our outstanding public universities. And by the way, since we're in Michigan, I, 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 take a look at what he said about the auto industry. Now remember, when I, when I came into office, industry was flat on its back. And we made some tough decisions to bring workers, management, everybody together in order to revitalize the industry. Just last summer, Donald Trump said, you could have let it go bankrupt, frankly. Wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. I want you to understand, had, had the big three gone bankrupt, or two of the three gone bankrupt, that could have cost a million jobs across this country. That could have killed Michigan's economy. But Donald Trump didn't stop there. He actually suggested shipping Michigan's auto jobs to states that don't have unions so they can pay their workers less. Don't boo. I, so, so he, he, I mean, he said this, I, look it up. He said, squeeze Michigan, make Michigan hurt then your auto workers would have no choice but to accept less pay. That is not somebody who's a champion for working people. Don't boo. Oh, he can't hear your boos, but he'll hear your votes tomorrow. This is not somebody who's a champion for working families. For all his tough talk about China, he uses Chinese steel in his hotels. He's giving jobs to Chinese steel workers, not American steel workers, for all his tough talk on trade. The trade war he threatens to trigger might well damage the auto industry all over again. You gotta go. Every time my administration has brought a trade enforcement case against China that's been decided, the United States of America has won. That's how you stand up for American workers. So, so to every auto worker on the assembly line right here in Michigan, to every small business owner, every barkeep, every teacher in communities that depend on the auto industry, I think I've earned some credibility here. Plants, plants that were closing when I took office are working double shift now. The auto industry it has record sales. I think I've earned some credibility here. Manufacturing jobs have grown at the fastest rate since the 90s. When another Clinton was president, I think we've earned some credibility here. So when I tell you that Donald Trump is not the guy who's going to look out for you, you need to listen. Do not be bamboozled. <laughs> Don't fall for the okie doke. In his 70 years on earth, the Donald has never shown any regard for working folks. I don't think he knows working people. Except for the folks who clean up in his hotels and the folks who mow the fairway on his golf course. He didn't care about working people then, he won't now. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton is going to put forward the biggest investment in new jobs since World War II. Plans. She's got plans to grow manufacturing. Plans to boost people's wages. Plans to help students with their college debt. Specific plans, not vague plans, not imaginary plans. Not plans that don't add up. She knows how to do it. And that's why she needs to be the next president of the United States as long as you vote. Now let me tell you something else I've learned about this job, Michigan. I love you! I love you too, but I got business to do here. Hold on. You know, well, one thing, I, one, one thing you learn about this job is who you are, 
what you are doesn't change once you move into Oval Office. It only gets magnified. A spotlight is put on you. It's like an EKG for your character. If you denigrate minorities before you take office, then you'll denigrate minorities after you take office. If you think of immigrants as criminals and rapists when you're running for office, then that's how you're going to think once you're in office. If you mock people with disabilities or treat women as objects, calling them pigs and dogs and rating them on a 1 to 10 scale instead of based on their character and intelligence, then that's how you're going to think when you're in office. If you insult POWs and talk down our troops and say you know more than our generals do about fighting terrorism even though you don't know the difference between Shia and Sunni, then that's how you're going to conduct yourself as a commander-in-chief. You know, it's bad being arrogant when you know what you're talking about. But it's really bad being arrogant when you don't know what you're talking about. If you accept the support of Klan sympathizers, if, if they, they say they really like what you're doing and you're kind of slow to denounce or separate yourself from them, that's what you're going to do when you're in office. If you disrespect the Constitution by threatening to shut down a free press when they write things you don't like, or threaten to throw your opponent in jail while you're in the middle of a presidential debate, <laughs> or discriminate against people of different faiths, that's what you will do when you're in office, regardless of the oath to uphold the Constitution that you have to take in this office. So Donald Trump is uniquely unqualified to hold this job. But the good news, Michigan, is you are uniquely qualified to make sure he does not get the job. But you got to vote. You've got to vote tomorrow to make that happen. And the good news is you don't just have to vote against something. You actually have a candidate who's worthy of your vote. A candidate who is smart. A candidate who's steady. A candidate who's tested. Probably the most qualified person ever to run for this office. The next president of the United States, Hillary Clinton. I, I will tell you, sometimes I get frustrated watching the coverage of this election. There's a bunch of it that has not been on the level. But I want to tell you something right now. The way campaigns have unfolded, we just start accepting crazy stuff as normal. And, and, and people, if they just repeat attacks enough and outright lies over and over again, as long as it's on Facebook and people can see it, as long as it's on social media, people start believing it. And, and, and it creates this dust cloud of nonsense. So I've had to bite my tongue after a lot of the nonsense I've heard about Hillary. I know Chelsea has. Can you imagine? Just crazy conspiracy theorizing. But I know Hillary. She's somebody who's dedicated her life to making this country better. Think about how she, think about how she got her start as a young woman. She was about her age. While Donald Trump and his dad were being sued by the Justice Department for denying housing to African-American families, Hillary, about your age, was going undercover from school to school to make sure minority kids were getting an equal ed education. She has not stopped fighting for justice and equality ever since. She'll be smart. She'll be steady. She actually respects working Americans. She'll make sure the economy works for everybody who are still struggling out there. Folks who, who feel like they're not getting a fair shake. She will work her heart out to create jobs that families can live on. Child care that you can afford. She'll fight for students who are struggling with college debt. She'll fight to make sure the women get paid the same for doing the same work as a guy. She knows workers deserve a higher minimum wage. She knows how the world works. She will make sure to keep America strong and respected.
She won't turn people against each other just to win an election. She will be a leader for all of, all of us because she knows we're stronger together. And that's what this all comes down to, Michigan. I said this before. The most important office in a democracy is not president, it's not senator, it's not congressman or mayor. It is the office of citizen. The most powerful word in our democracy is the word we. We the people. We shall overcome. Yes, we can. America has never been. America is not about one, what one person can do for you. I didn't say yes, I can. I said yes, we can. I told you I wasn't a perfect man, wouldn't be a perfect president, but I said I will work alongside you, I will work as hard as I can to make sure that all of us together can advance the causes we believe in. What we can achieve together through this sometimes frustrating, often slow, but ultimately enduring role that we play in self-government. This is what this country runs on, is you deciding that you care enough about it to get involved. Even when the odds are steep, even when the road is long, that's our history. That's, that's why patriots chose revolution over tyranny. That's, that's how GIs your age defeated fascism. That's how women found the courage to reach for the ballot. That's how marchers crossed the bridge in Selma. That's how workers organized for collective bargaining and better wages. They did it together. In this country, you don't have to be born to wealth or privilege to make a difference. You don't have to practice a certain faith or look a certain way to bend the arc of history in a better direction. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. That's what makes America exceptional. All of us equal. All of us having a voice. All of us making a claim on the American dream. All of us fulfilling our responsibilities and not just enjoying the rights of this incredible nation, this amazing experiment in self-government. That's what it's about. And so Michigan, whatever credibility I've earned after eight years as president, I am asking you to trust me on this one. I already voted. I voted for Hillary Clinton because I am absolutely confident that when she is president, this country will be in good hands. And I'm asking you to do the same, especially the young people here. It isn't that often in your life where you know you can make a difference. It's not that often you got a chance to move history in a better direction. This is one of those moments. It, this is one of those moments, don't let it slip away. You have the chance to reject a coarse, divisive, mean-spirited politics that would take us backwards. You can elect a leader who spent her entire life trying to appeal to the better natures, angels of our nature. You have a chance to elect our first female president. A president who will be an example for our daughters and our sons. And so after all the noise, after the negative ads, after all the campaigning, all the rallies, it now just comes down to you. It's out of Hillary's hands now, it's out of Michelle's hands, it's out of my hands. It's in your hands. The fate of our democracy depends on what you do when you step into that voting booth tomorrow. How many people you bring to make sure they vote. Do not fall into the easy cynicism that says your vote doesn't matter, all politicians are the same. That's what special interests and lobbyists, my opponents, Hillary's opponents, that's what they want you to think, so you don't go vote. Your vote matters. There are states where I won two votes a precinct. That's how I won that state. Your voice matters. Your voice makes a difference. I have heard it. And for all the tough lessons that I've learned during this presidency. 
for all the times I've fallen short. I have told Hillary, and I'll tell you, what's picked me up every single time, what has gotten me working as hard as I can, even when I'm discouraged, even when I'm down, it's been you, the American people. Yes, you go. Time and again, you've picked me up. The auto worker in Detroit who won the lottery but didn't kick back and retire, bought his wife one of the new cars he built, kept clocking away because he loved his work. That's who I think about. The young woman in Sterling Heights who wrote me seven years ago to say she was worried about her family's future in Michigan, then checked in again to say this year that her dad's supply company was hiring. She was working her way through Macomb Community College. She kept me going. The woman in North Carolina, the woman in North Carolina was stripped from the voter rolls a few weeks ago, but insisted on winning her registration back, wrote me and said, I remember the victories previous generations won for me and generations after me. I can assure you, Mr. President, I will keep fighting. If I haven't stopped fighting at 100 years old, then neither can you. A 100-year-old woman, if she's not tired, I'm not tired. She's kept me going. So Michigan, I ask, I ask you to do for Hillary what you did for me. I ask you to carry her the same way you carried me. I ask you to make her better the same way you made me better. And tomorrow, if you're willing to stand with me again, if you're willing to get your friends and neighbors and co-workers to the polls again, if you're willing to reject fear again, if you're willing to embrace hope again, then we will finish what we started. We will elect Hillary as president. We will remind the world why the United States of America is the greatest nation on earth. Yes, we can. Let's get to work. God bless you. God bless these United States of America. Let's go vote. The President of the United States, a rousing speech, uh, asking all the young people there in Ann Arbor, Michigan specifically, to go out and vote, to vote for Hillary Clinton for President of the United States. Hello, I'm Wolf Blitzer. It's 1 p.m. here in Washington. Wherever you're watching from around the world, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're going to have full analysis of what we just heard from the President. Up first, though, it's the final countdown. We are less than a day away from the presidential election here in the United States. Tomorrow is the culmination of one of the most bitter and most bizarre campaigns in American history, and the candidates are in a final sprint to the finish line. Donald Trump campaigning today in Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, and Michigan at a rally in Sarasota, Florida. Trump told supporters he's done his part. Now he says it's up to them. This is it, folks. We will never have another opportunity not in four years not in eight years it'll be over with supreme court justices with people pouring into our country this is it this is it good luck get out there i did my thing i mean i work his running mate mike pence joins a trump in new hampshire and michigan after solo stops in michigan minnesota and pennsylvania hillary clinton started her day in pittsburgh she also campaigns in Michigan and North Carolina. Here's what she told supporters at that Pittsburgh rally just a little while ago. To think about what we are capable of doing together, the kind of future that we can create if we search for and find common ground. And it is thrilling to have traveled across our country to see the hopefulness to talk about the positive changes that are occurring to really see America at its best her running mate uh, Tim Kaine campaigns in North Carolina and Florida President Obama meanwhile joins Hillary Clinton later tonight in Philadelphia after a rally in Ann Arbor Michigan we just saw him there uh, he was introduced by Hillary Clinton's daughter Chelsea uh, President Obama was nostalgic while looking ahead I'm feeling a little sentimental this is, this is gonna be my last probably my last day of campaigning for a while people in 08 decided to choose hope over fear. 
And over the course of these eight years, all across 50 states, I've always seen what made America great. I have seen you. Americans of every faith, every background, Republicans and Democrats, who understand that we're stronger together. Former President Bill Clinton, he's out campaigning with his wife in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Vice President Joe Biden, he's rallying Hillary Clinton supporters in Tallahassee, Florida. My picture is coming in. Now, that event expected to get underway shortly. Throughout this hour, we will bring you live reports from our team of correspondents covering key battleground states around the country. Uh, two of the states most in play tomorrow, Pennsylvania and North Carolina. CNN senior political correspondent Brianna Keeler is in Pittsburgh. Our national correspondent Gary Tuckman is in Charlotte. Uh, Brianna, what's the confidence level for the Clinton camp in Pennsylvania? I think they're feeling pretty confident. They're saying that they have an uh, unprecedented number of uh, doors that are being knocked on here in the uh, area, not just in Pittsburgh, but specifically outside of Philadelphia, which is so important to Hillary Clinton when it comes to Pennsylvania. And of course, Pennsylvania is so key to her overall state strategy and her pathway toward the White House. Something struck me, though, Wolf, as you played that sound of Hillary Clinton striking a positive tone here in Pittsburgh. And that's just that, you know, she also, in the exact same speech, um, she also, in the exact same speech, was uh, emphasizing that Donald Trump is experientially and temperamentally unfit. So it just shows you that even as she has sort of tried to get into this positive message as the campaign has ended, it's uh, really been difficult for her to do uh, in the end as polls tightened and as that news came out uh, really reigniting her email controversy. Welcome news yesterday that the FBI is not changing its conclusion that it came to in July, that there will be no... Uh, charges, uh, certainly even though they said she was reckless in the use of her email as Secretary of State. But overall, this is about getting people to the polls. And the Clinton campaign has taken this work very seriously, and they feel that they are in a very good place, especially compared to Donald Trump, who doesn't really have uh, a ground game situation and has been relying very much on the party wolf. Brianna Keeler reporting from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Gary, you've been talking to voters in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's a key battleground state. What's the enthusiasm level based on the conversations you've had? Well, both nationally, a lot of people are not enthusiastic because they haven't liked the tone of the campaign. But here on the campus of UNC Charlotte and throughout the state of North Carolina, you get this sense of enthusiasm wave because everyone knows the importance of the state. Hillary Clinton would love to win here, but Donald Trump needs to win here. It's hard to see how he can navigate the electoral map if he doesn't win in the state of North Carolina. So Trump will be coming here. He's made a lot of stops in North Carolina for the last 17 months. His last visit will be in Raleigh two hours from now. And Hillary Clinton is coming here, too. She is also coming to Raleigh, the state capital, at midnight. It will be her last rally in Raleigh before Election Day tomorrow. Now, both in 2008 and 2012, the races here were very close, but it hasn't been like that in North Carolina for most of the state's history. Between the end of the Civil War in 1964, 26 presidential races, Democrats, yes, Democrats, won 25 times. The only time a Republican won was 1928 when Herbert Hoover beat Al Smith. And then between 1968 and now, Republicans have dominated. Democrats only went in twice, 1976, when Jimmy Carter, the governor of nearby Georgia, won. And then in 2008, when Barack Obama beat John McCain by 0.3 of 1%. Four years later, Barack Obama lost to Mitt Romney by 2%. So the last two years, two election years for presidential races, very close. We expect the same this time around in 2016. And the polls close tomorrow at 7.30 Eastern time, Wolf. All right, Gary, thanks very much. Gary Tuckman reporting from North Carolina. Let's get some perspective right now from our panel. Joining us, CNN Politics Executive Editor Mark Preston, our Chief Political Analyst Gloria Borger, our Senior Political Reporter Nia Malika Henderson, and our Chief Political Correspondent Dana Bash. Uh, Hillary Clinton, she's clearly trying to make sure she has that so-called blue wall, yeah. Democratic-leaning states on her side. Uh, Donald Trump clearly going after that blue wall. He wants to crack it uh, if he can. Uh, can she hold on? We don't know. Uh, it looks good in certain states, her team is, is telling us. But again, particularly in a state like Pennsylvania or Michigan, where she's traveling to today, we don't have early voting. So we really don't have any indicators of how things are going to go. Uh, their get-out-the-vote operation is uh, vaunted. 
and uh, they say that they knocked on 14 and a half million doors over the weekend. They made voter voter to voter uh, contacts. Uh, the RNC has a really really upgraded get out the vote operation this year. Their data analytics are miles apart from where they were in 2012. So they believe they're in the hunt here, and they're handing that over to the uh, to the Trump campaign. I think what we're seeing in the travel today is that each of these candidates are going to states that they feel like they have a shot at and and in, and in Donald Trump's case must win. Trump is going to Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Michigan. He's got to win a couple <laughs> of those if he is going to win this election. Can he do it? Can he win a Democratic state like Michigan, for example, or Minnesota or Pennsylvania? These are states that for years have gone Democratic in presidential contests. Right. I mean, it, it, look, it's going to be difficult, no question. But, I mean, this is a campaign that none of us could ever explain or a year ago <laughs> even say where we would be right now. You know, I was thinking about this the other night, just... You know, this has been such a surprise and a roller coaster ride where you had your ups and downs, which you would see in a normal campaign, but we've never seen someone like Donald Trump. Now, I just wonder if, uh, if Michigan is an overplay by him, but, you know, the fact of the matter is the fact that we're seeing Hillary Clinton in Michigan says something, right? So they must be seeing internal numbers themselves where they need to, you know, keep that blue wall stabilized. And, and, you know, the fact that they're in Pennsylvania, of course, is a really big state we should all be watching tomorrow because as Gloria says no early voting in that state so they're trying to go in very hard into that state Hillary Clinton has two stops one on the west as we saw uh, on the western side of the state and then you know one in Philadelphia tomorrow uh, rather think, tonight Trump thinks he can get those blue-collar uh, Democrats right. those so-called Reagan exactly. Democrats to come over to his side Kenny well you know he talks a lot about trade and and the economy and bringing jobs back uh, We'll see. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the question is, I don't know. I, I would say this, though. The path for Donald Trump is still difficult, okay? The path for Hillary Clinton is a lot easier than for him. I think what's really helping, what's really helping Hillary Clinton, the Latino vote, yeah. by all accounts, exactly. they have been very, very motivated, and they're coming out in big numbers in states like Florida, Nevada, uh, other states as well, uh, North Carolina, for example. Yeah, uh, they are. It's the Trump effect, right, uh, in many ways, and it's also, I think, a testament of uh, to Hillary Clinton's uh, team. They're organizing in states like Nevada and states like uh, North Carolina and in states like Florida. If you look at Florida, uh, the Hispanic vote is up 103% from 2008. In North Carolina, it's up 85% from 2012. Uh, in, in Clark County, which is in Nevada, it's about 30% uh, Hispanic. Uh, that voter turn, early voting turnout is up about 8%. This is probably going to be the story of Absolutely. the election. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw in 2012 and 2008 the surge in the African American vote, record numbers. I think we're going to see the same thing this go around uh, with Hispanic voters. Hispanic voters uh, in previous elections were about 10 percent of the electorate, about 11 million voters. Uh, I think we're going to see 12 percent, 13 percent, maybe 13, 14 million uh, voters this time. And again, this is about Trump. You remember what he said uh, in that first uh, speech when he was announcing his campaign, talking about illegal immigrants. And even in his speech there, uh, when he was talking about people flooding into the country, uh, that has very much uh, roused this Hispanic electorate uh, that for many years had been rumored about as a political force, but I think finally we're going to see it in and, this campaign. And well, to, to marry what Mark and what Nia were just saying, the answer to, I think, your question Mark was saying about, about white working class voters, will he get them? Probably, probably more than a Republican in recent history has. It's unlikely, given what Nia was just talking about, the surge of the Latino vote, that that's going to be enough. And that speaks to something that we have been talking about cycle after cycle, the changing face of this country, mm -hmm. this changing face of the electorate. And it is why, three and a half years ago, the Republican National Committee, in its autopsy report, which is what they called it after they got their clocks cleaned in 2012 on the presidential level, uh, went to look at how they can change, what they need to do to change, and the number one thing was reach out to Latinos, do a better job uh, in the off years, but also policy-wise was recommending to Republican leaders in Congress get immigration reform off the table, and they couldn't do it.
for lots of reasons they couldn't do it the republican led house of representatives didn't even take it up uh, whether it was a comprehensive bill or even in baby steps because the base didn't have the stomach for it so this is the conundrum that the republican party you know in. high on that list also that you're talking about dana was gender yeah exactly because in the last uh, mid uh, in the last 2012 election was the war against women remember that phrase and so they also understood that they had to appeal to a broader group of women the other story of this campaign so long as we're talking about demographics we've been talking about latinos is women voters yeah and women vote in larger numbers than men generally mm -hmm. and uh, we're gonna have to see uh, how the gender card plays here and whether women turn out for whatever reason not necessarily because Hillary Clinton is a woman but ironically perhaps because of Donald Trump yeah. um, we'll have to see how large how large a gender gap that is and whether Donald Trump can make up that gap with uh, white men whom he is doing very well with as we see in a lot of the polling and we'll, we'll see if uh, President Obama is really working hard to recreate that that base that coalition that got him twice elected president of the United States working very hard so is his wife Michelle all of them are going to be in Philadelphia with Hillary Clinton later tonight and John and bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen Spring right. yeah. let's not forget, forget John the Jersey Bar love. <laughs> and Bruce Springsteen two guys from New Jersey uh, remember you can get the latest on tomorrow's presidential election all day right here on CNN coming up Donald Trump uh, and Hillary Clinton making their final push working to seal the deal lock in votes over the next 24 hours we're going to talk to representatives from both campaigns that's next also caught in the middle of an ISIS ambush. An incredible report from the front lines of Mosul. But first, let's see what's happening in the battleground state of Ohio. Our Martin Savage is standing by in Cleveland. Martin. Well, here in Ohio, they have been voting for nearly a month. Early voting will end in nearly one hour. Turnouts here in Cleveland over the weekend, very high. That's good for Hillary. The bad news is, the overall projection is down from four years ago. It means Ohio's still a toss-up. That's the picture here. Golden Corral, seven days.